Well, for those who have joined us, welcome to today's panel. This is uh, Biomaterials, what is the future of bio-based innovations? Um, my name is Matt Sturbins, and I'm a, I'm a skier, so welcome skiers, and uh, welcome to all of our panelists. We appreciate you guys joining us, especially uh, Matthias Fossil, who is joining us all the way from Switzerland. So in this case, good afternoon, Matthias. Uh, so yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about this shared experience we all we all have working with one another. And when we were just getting ready for the, the panel to begin, we started to kind of reflect on how some of our contributions are, are behind the scenes, if you will. This is, this is deep in the lab. This is uh, an insight to some of the materials that end up becoming part of the marketing um, stories that end up in consumer messaging, communications, and ultimately um, seen visible in, in certain logos and whatnot on consumer products. Uh, we live in a world where the trend is to move towards an increasingly more green and clean while at the same time remain innovative. And uh, how is this possible using natural elements? Well, it's, it's largely become possible because we're, we're using resin suitable for the construction of skis. We're using materials that are advancing textiles and uh, we're consuming foods and, and personal care that's derived from completely new profiles of materials. And, uh, and largely, a lot of those possibilities are made by some of the guests on this panel today. So uh, we have joining us Scott Franklin. He is the chief scientific officer and co-founder of Checkerspot. And he is the creator of materials derived from microalgae oils. We have Matthias Fossil. He's the CEO and founder of Beyond Surface Technologies from Switzerland, who are set to radically change the textile finishing industry by advancing green chemistry solutions without compromising on performance. And we have Desi Bonato, who is a uh, president global sales manager at Entropies. And it's a company that Desi um, was a material scientist accredited for founding, as well as companies in commercializing bio-based materials known as SAP uh, and Lingro, a natural fiber composite company. So just quick briefly, uh, kind of set the tone here um, with this panel, we have you know, sport and technology that are strongly linked together. Um, each athlete's performance cannot be evaluated alone without considering the, the equipment. Uh, the, in this case, like a, a runner in his shoes or a swimmer in a suit, um, a Formula One driver in his race car. Um, you know, in my world, it's a skier and whose preparation, strength, ability is only as powerful as the equipment that they ski on. Uh, it's pretty cool. My introduction to biomaterials started actually quite recently. In the fall of 2018, I received a call from the CEO and co-founder of Checkerspot, Charlie Dimler. Charlie caught me kind of working from the kitchen table. Um, I just sold a ski brand that I started in 2002 called Forefront Skis. And um, I had run that for about 16 years. This company, it's, uh, it was designed to kind of upset the industry in terms of shape geometries, communications. It, it took leadership in, a, in an emerging uh, category of skiing known as free skiing. And it really kind of set uh, a leadership or a pioneering leadership role for the industry to follow. Our biggest goal was to try to figure out how to make skis that didn't fall apart. <laughs> the goal was to try to make skis that, you know, we knew um, would work better for us as athletes, um, that our sponsors just simply didn't have that vision. So we, we sought out to, you know, initially disrupt some of the supply chain, reaching out to snowboard manufacturers who would help us build skis. Um, and through the course of that experience, we worked our way up and down the west coast of the USA. This is back in 2002, 2003. Eventually realizing that this brand was, was going to require a lot of, uh, um, a lot of handholding and um, a lot of additional marketing resource with consumers. So manufacturing was one which we needed to outsource immediately. And so along trying a very exhaustive run in the States with snowboard factories, we decided to move production. And this gave me an opportunity to introduce um, our skis to a much broader scope of consumer profiles because of the distribution opportunities that existed by centrally locating our manufacturing at the heart of the industry, which is in Europe. The problem I realized quite quickly was that the skis that we wanted to have them build for us, which essentially turned our sponsors into our suppliers, um, they were fabulous skis, but they were all designed out of the exact same materials. Furthermore, you know, without being able to differentiate your product base because of the materials that everybody else is using, we also had very little influence on how we could curb some of the waste stream results of the manufacturing techniques. 
we were just flabbergasted with the environment that skis were built in. And so over the course of what better end of 12 to 14 years of working with these contract manufacturers in Europe, witnessing this massive scale of ski production and realizing how handcuffed we were as a small brand to disrupt the supply chain, to introduce new materials. We had no other choice but to start our own little factory in Salt Lake City, Utah. And that gave us kind of like a little incubation lab. And it also brought in for us a little bit of visibility to other types of materials that our factory at the time wasn't interested in exploring. So once we were able to validate those materials, we were then able to introduce them and show them a case proof point that, hey, these materials work and they impact positively the performance of this product. And by result of working with these materials, we've been able to eliminate these other materials. And that slowly started to perpetuate for the brand in its later years. And it still continues on with its new owners. But it was kind of just the start and the entry point for me to realize that there was more to commercializing a product than just the aesthetics and or just like the geometries, for example. There was an opportunity with materials. And so as the brand was sold and I stayed on to learn a bit about the distribution strategy of that brand, I then started to wonder, is there other ways to differentiate a product in this category? Or are we all just going to be left to have to build skis out of the same exact materials or build jackets out of the exact same building materials? And so lo and behold, one day the phone rang. And here's an individual who had just partnered up with one of our panelists, Scott Franklin, to start a materials company using microalgae as an oil profile. And of course, the first thing I asked was, hey, man, would you just send me some of your stuff? And at that point, I realized, man, I'm actually a little bit sooner on this project than I thought. And uh, the material that we had at the time was about the size of a silo cup. <laughs> so we had to kind of figure out, all right, well, let's build some materials of dimension that we could use for this application. And then start to think about how that performance characteristic can be enhanced to really make this consumer product better. For the first time in my life, I had never had the visibility to design a new, a new material that went into a consumer product that could not only differentiate its performance, but give it a completely different feel and give it a marketing story that was unparalleled. Nobody's been playing in that space. Nobody seemed to care. Everybody was just satisfied with the existing raw material supply chain. So it really opened up my mind and, and, I, and I really appreciate the opportunity to work with outsiders, to be honest, uh, as a real core participant in skiing to be able to now network with individuals who really don't have a whole lot of history in the space. They give me so much understanding about things that we're not paying attention to. And so for me, this has been really a unique experience to work with Checker Spot and now to also work with some of these panelists that are on um, for today's meeting, because what we can do together is so much greater than the sum. So enough about me and my story. I'd like to introduce Scott Franklin. Uh, again, I mentioned previously, Scott is a co-founder and chief science officer at CheckerSpot. Scott, would you mind just kind of sharing with the group a little bit about CheckerSpot and how you see CheckerSpot's innovation playing a role into the future of materials? Sure, thanks, Matt. So, um, what CheckerSpot is at its core is, is it rests on basically three technologies, three pillars when we think about the company. You know, back, company, uh, my co-founder and I, Charlie Dimmler, core, core to that idea was that we would develop a brand. Um, and that was very important to the company from its very beginning because we knew experience, we would need a way to animate our technology. So rather than focus on producing, you know, molecules, monomers, and try and sell those to, to chemical companies or end users, Based on our past experience, we saw the power of, of being able to create what we really do and have, have a customer and end use consumer in their hand and be able to see what it was that, that these molecules could manifest in. So brand was very, very critical. And we had to figure out what, what space, what, what would, you know, what space would that brand occupy? And my co-founder, Charlie, was pretty insistent at the very beginning that, that it would be something in outdoor recreation, but we didn't know what, and we didn't know where. Um, and my background is actually algal molecular biology. I'm not a material scientist. I know a lot about the input algae, the triglyceride oils. <clears throat> and for many, many decades, they formed a huge basis of the oleochemicals industry. So there's certainly a lot of materials we can derive from them. 
But I have to admit, I was a little skeptical at the very beginning, but totally got the brand idea. And then we found Matt. Um, and that's crystallized the idea that we would um, focus on outdoor and an outdoor brand and that the first SK first product would be backcountry skis. But these technology platforms that we have are basically pillars. They're a molecular theory, which are the organisms that make the raw materials, the triglyceride oil outputs. And, uh, which is based on material science and polymer chemistry. We take those outputs and we can modify them and then formulate those into materials, into polymers, and assess the physical trying to solve some performance property with a given material. And the lens the focusing mechanism today, primarily for Checker Spot, is the brand Wonder Alpine. What are the problems trying to solve in ski builds? But as the company grew and we established other relationships, for example, with companies like Surface Technologies and Matthias and his team, we began to look at other applications for these materials, for example, in textile finishes. So now we're trying to solve a different problem. But we're always starting with sort of the same raw material and trying to solve and answer different questions. And then the third pillar of our technology which today resides almost entirely in Salt Lake City is fabrication. So how do we take those, those materials, those polymers, and how do we animate them? How do we turn them into an end use uh, product that we can sell directly to a consumer? And so what the company seeks to do from a technology perspective is to integrate all of those different pieces of the technology and in a very iterative fashion, solve sort of the performance metrics that we're we're trying to get to with a given material. It's pretty unique that there's molecular biology and fabrication under one roof. Um, was this it's always crazy? <laughs> I mean this always this wasn't always the way it was. Um, usually you had a lab that did the work and then that would move on to the next organization. That's right. So typically those things would be very segregated and in, in industrial biotechnology where I've spent most of my career, again, you're making a raw material, a monomer, for example, and um, you're trying to get adoption by typically large incumbent chemical companies to use those bio-based monomers to replace what they've been using for many, many decades. So this is very different. And in that respect, we're, we're, um, a very small company, we're fewer than 50 people, but we're highly vertically integrated. We go all the way from a raw material monomer to an end use consumer product, which has a lot of advantages and a lot of challenges. Great. I think we'll speak a little bit later about how democratizing that innovation plays a role in many other brands needs as well. Um, but right. having the vehicle to show how the technology can be influential through this brand, I think is what really is something that is so unique with Checker Spot. And obviously I'm quite prideful to be a part of that. Uh, you, you introduced uh, Matthias Fossil here with, Be with Beyond Surface Technologies. Uh, again, Matthias, thank you for joining us from Switzerland. We really appreciate you making time this evening. Um, yeah, so he just kind of brought up BST and um, you know, talking about textile treatments and whatnot. And I just thought maybe it'd be kind of fun to have you talk a little bit about how does this microalgae ingredient uh, work in textile treatments and, and what's BST all about? Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so we are a Swiss-based company, as I said, a technology-driven uh, company. And we started 13 years ago, really with the main purpose to advanced green chemistry in the textile industry. And, and that at a time, and, and unfortunately still is a rather unique uh, business model because the whole industry runs on petroleum, on crude oil, on, on finite raw materials. And most of the consumers don't even have the uh, option to realize what's in a fabric they buy, right? Because the, the chemistry you add to fibers of fabrics can't be seen in most of the time, you know, it's not a color uh, yet. 
it is quite often instrumental to the performance, the effect a consumer wishes to obtain when buying a garment. So um, our group over here, we are all like uh, textile nerds, I would like to say. We have been in the industry for a long, long time. And it took us way too long until that day when we took a step back and, you know, it's like, okay, so we are working in an industry that has been using crude oil, petroleum as the main material for the last 100 years or so. And, you know, now being in 2008 at the time, aren't there smarter materials than crude oil to create textile chemicals that will end up in garments that are used by the consumer. So really the, the purpose of starting beyond service technologies was to see how far could we take it to replace crude oil based material in textile chemicals. So replacing finite raw materials with renewable ones. And, and by doing so, you actually gain some obvious advantages. You know, you get a radically lower carbon footprint. And, uh, you know, one should note that the textile industry is one of the biggest contributors of carbon footprint on this planet. So um, replacing finite with renewable helps on that side, but it also enables you to have material that much easier biodegrades you know, once it gets into the environment, it doesn't just stay there forever. And, and it also doesn't interfere with any potential recycling process, which is going to be more and more crucial if you look at a more circular economy. And, and you know, all that uh, without compromising on performance was quite a business model to get started with, right? And uh, at a time when we did that in 2008, um, the word sustainability uh, or a purpose-driven company in our industry wasn't heard of. So people kind of looked at us we, like we were eye charts when we said this is exactly what we are set up to do or what we will, will embark on. You know, uh, we want to find material that replaces crude oil. We won't give up on performance though because we don't want to sell because it's green. We do want to sell because it works. And and while the first and obvious step from crude oil was towards plant seed oils, we eventually, after getting to know Checkerspot, Charlie, Scott, um, looked more and more into the world of microalgae. And uh, those opened up um, a much wider playing field and, and enlarged our toolbox to be able to innovate. That's great. That's great. And I know you guys have an application known as the Midori Biowick that's using this microalgae uh, oil profile to support uh, performance wicking applications. Um, Scott mentioned that we had started to look more aggressively at a waterproof breathable solution. Um, this has obviously been a uh, tough nut to crack, as they say. And um, Scott was mentioning a little bit of technology known as a polyurethane disbursement. Um, how would this type of waterproof breathable solution be benefited by the use of alcohol oils? And how would that application differ from what ex currently exists to support that kind of application? Um, so shall, shall I take on Scott first? You know, yeah. if, um, in, in the textile industry, you know, uh, the material that had been the market standard for a long, long time obviously was based on, not obviously, but as most people know by now, has been based on perfluorocarbons. And, and so the industry really uh, wants and needs to get away looking for alternative material. However, you know, coming up with a material that is, let's say, safer in use but matching the performance is, as you said, probably one of the toughest projects you can currently embark upon in our industry, right? It has been tried by many companies for more than 10 years by now. And it seems like every, every company, every chemical company from being startups to the biggest chemical companies in the world came all to a certain level of performance and got stuck there, right? So, you know, then we looked around and said, okay, how, how do we have to approach this to 
get through that ceiling of performance, which wasn't good enough to present a true alternative to PFC-based chemistry. And, and here comes, uh, again, the microalgae and the variety of types of microalgae and the versatility into play. We, by working together with uh, Scott and, and, and Jackerspot, we can design a material from scratch. You know, typically in, in our industry, people would look at, you know, um, what polymers exist, how can you use those polymers, how can you blend them, mix them, uh, modify them, and but hardly uh, people really go back to uh, square one and say, okay, if I would have to design a material, how would I do that? What kind of uh, performance would I like to see? What kind of uh, uh, aspects do I need to take into consideration? Um, and and that you know, starting from the basic stuff from from microalgae, um, we can do all that with with the help of uh, of Scott. So um, we have been on that project uh, to redesign the the polymer that's instrumental to a water repellent finish. So PUD I should have said stands for polyurethane dispersion, and uh, I should add it's probably more a WPUD, a water based polyurethane dispersion because we also want to eliminate any solvent. Um, so we, we hope that by being able to design different structures from scratch, we'll find a eventual polymer structure that can increase the hydrophobicity, so the water repellent side of the polymer to an extent where we can set a new standard um, in repellent performance. That's, that's the goal, and that's what we are working up on since, since about a year. That's awesome. I think the kind of the, 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 the melding of innovation and performance is so critical. And you speak to how consumers have a uh, desire for high performance uh, use, but want to be moving more towards a renewable resource. They want to lessen their carbon footprint. Uh, and I think this is a good time to introduce another panelist, uh, Desi Bonato. Thank you, joining. Thank you for joining us, Desi. Um, you know, circling back to say Wonder Alpine, for example, where we're currently working with several of the materials that you've had a helping hand in developing. Um, you know, you've had uh, a, a time in your career to develop a, a bio-based epoxy resin system called SuperSat. Um, I'm just kind of curious, what's your thought at the time, like in your mindset? As 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 Matthias mentioned in 2008, he saw this this problem developing where we needed to wean ourselves off of some of these high carbon producing materials. And yet I think you were also on the same wavelength, but in a different side of the industry, developing resin systems for more hard good applications. Um, and then starting Lingrove, which is an awesome composites brand. Just maybe introduce our um, kind of a little bit of your thought process along the way and, and how your you know, vision for bio-based materials um, resonates with you today. Yeah, thanks Matt. Um... And thanks for having me. Sure. No, I, th I think one of the, the themes that both Scott and Matthias have talked about and something that, you know, we learned the hard way um, is this idea that something customers aren't going to buy things just because they're green. They need to work. Right. And nobody's going to care how sustainable or how green something is if it doesn't work properly. Um, so we when when we set out. <laughs> Um, to kind of design our first product, you know, and I think this is a common mistake scientists and engineers do when they're when they're designing a product is they think that they're the customer, right? And so we poured all our all our efforts into maximizing the sustainability of a resin system for our first product. And when we put it on the table to the first customer, they're like, we can't use this. <laughs> we don't have the tools to use this. So, you know, I think that that you know that that was kind of a wake-up call to us and that um you know there's a there's a market and there's a there's an industry around us that we need to understand and then take all these you know the skills that we have as as chemists and as engineers and and tailor those and, and come up with products that fit that um you know again our, our us using sustainability um as a performance feature was definitely new at the time um, and it took a lot of uh, a lot of convincing of of customers that 
that they're 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 our cut a lot of convincing of our customers that their customers are eventually going to see things like sustainability as a performance attribute. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other the other thing that you know we really focused in on um, early on and a lesson that we learned kind of going through this process um, is this idea of how do you how do you quantify sustainability and, and how do you how do you communicate that to to customers? Um, you know, when when we first started, things like life cycle analysis were were just brand new, um, and there wasn't a lot of <clears throat> data or information out there, and there still isn't um, because of industries like the chemical industry. You know, transparency is not <laughs> one of their fortes. So we really focused hard on trying to develop that idea and push concepts like LCA. Um, you know, showing what your impacts are, being able to compare that to, you know, not just um, petroleum based chemicals, but, you know, all other options, going really deep into our own supply chain and, and understanding where our start materials came from. And then ultimately finding kind of the right customers that could help take that information and communicate it. I mean, um, one of our, uh, I think throughout this conference there's a lot of people speaking from Burton I think they they've definitely were one of the, the key people to help us use tools like LCA and 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 um, you know all our bio-based content measurement systems and take something that's very technical and make it make it um, consumable by by the end customer and so that that's been another thing that we've really really found is you know obviously we need to a we need to balance um, sustainability with performance um, and then you know be able to communicate <clears throat> how um, the environmental benefits of you know whether it's our raw materials our chemistry processes all the technology that we pour into these things you know how that how that ultimately adds up for the consumer and and you know why they should be buying this product how do you guys approach developing new materials from a price conscious point of view? I think that's, you, you mentioned early on that like everybody thinks that, you know, something green um, should cost more, that it should have certain type of um, ca carbon offset, but the, but the offset oftentimes ends up being in the sacrifice for the consumer. They pay more for it. And I know through our history, working together, building skis and whatnot with your resin systems and, and now composites, there's always kind of been this question, where do we stack up in terms of cost of these raw material inputs? How do you guys approach it from a design? Like when you guys are developing a material, a resin system, how do you approach that? Where does pricing fall in your consciousness in that regard? Is it all about scaling? How does it work for you guys? I mean, scaling is always an important piece of that. You know, hitting economies of scales is, is, is an important piece of scaling any material system, whether it's bio-based or not. Um, you know, but it, it's definitely a conversation that needs to happen up front all the time. Um, and, and just like, just like um, you know, people aren't going to buy something just because it's sustainable. People aren't, are also not going to just pay whatever it costs because something's sustainable too. So there's always a price constraint and we always need to be cognizant of that. I think for us, it's, it's really been trying to find applications. You know, our, our materials, you know, tend to be slightly more expensive. I mean, I think that's something that you know, we'll always say up front, but we also try to try to communicate to our customers that, you know, if, if our material costs 10 cents dollar, 10 cents more per pound, let's go and turn that, that 10 cents into a dollar at the consumer level. Right. And so the, the key is trying to find applications where, um, the, the consumers are, are, concerned about sustainability as a, as a performance attribute are willing to, you know, if there is a price increase, foot that bill, um, you know, sporting goods has been a great one in that, in that regard. Um, we've been, we've been spending a lot of time in building materials. Um, that's been another application where people are, are kind of willing to, to look at a premium um, for, you know, this idea, idea of sustainability. So, you know, we're always looking for that edge. Um, um, you know, but again, we, we always understand that, that, you know, there's always a limit to that. And, you know, if we don't have those conversations up front, then, then it's really hard that when, when we do get to that pricing discussion, <laughs> meeting everybody's expectations can be hard. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's a great point to make, I think. And, and realizing adoption is, is one of the leading 
benefits of uh, this technology taking on wider spread um, impact. Um, Scott, we haven't heard from you in a second. I, I thought maybe it'd be interesting to talk about um, your vision of performance uh, versus sustainability. I know that's been a core um, FO at Checker Spot of leading with performance as our metric. Um, yeah, and you've had experience working with other consumer products in your past life. Just kind of maybe walk us through a little bit of your point of view in that respect with performance being a, a, a higher metric than, than that of what the biomaterial actually is. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be giving the consumer performance and ideally superior performance. I think, I think the challenge with a lot of bio-based materials in the past has been that uh, kind of what Desi alluded to as, as scientists, a lot of, a lot of companies can treat their technology as, you know, sacred and it's all about, you know, this thing that I've developed and it's the be all and the end all and um, not focusing enough on what does the consumer need to get out of the, the end product and the end material. I think the the advantage that we have when working with biomaterials that that people haven't had the opportunity to focus. Again, I come back to this idea of brand and product as a focusing mechanism. When I think about what we're doing at Checker Spot uh, and through Wonder Alpine, you know, the amount of applications and formulation development that we do around some of the, you know, I'll use cast polyurethanes as an example. If we were simply making a raw material that went into polyurethanes and trying to sell that to end use chemical companies, we would never have the opportunity to do this kind of applications and formulations development. And in doing that, discover all of these really valuable and useful performance properties that are derived from our starting raw material. And when you start to do that kind of work, you realize that the big chemical companies are no different. They've got a bunch of monomers they're trying to sell and they try and figure out how to market those things. And in the past, not so much today, in the past, they did a huge amount of formulation and applications development work because nobody knew how to use those things that came out of a barrel of oil. And I think the, the bio-based economy has lagged behind in that regard, thinking that they were simply going to make or we were simply going to make drop-in replacements and not put the hard work into all the applications and sort of formulation development work that you need to do to get to performance. The molecules aren't gonna do that inherently. There's a lot of work you have to put in to get something that really, really works. Mm -hmm. Matthias, how do you see that balance uh, of impact between the manufacturing process and the materials themselves? I know that's a huge part of how BST contributes to the supply chain of textile treatments. I mean, it, it's, it's not a simple uh, question to answer. When we, when we started uh, 13 years ago, there, there wasn't even a definition of what's a bio-based chemical. You know, what, you know, everyone was talking about bio-based material, and you know, it could have been like uh, we use two percent of biocarbon material in our product, so we have a bio-based material. And and so when we looked around, we thought like, that 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 kind of doesn't makes sense right <laughs> and and so we 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 really in many aspects when we started the company had to come up with our own definitions with our own uh, uh, goals and, and, and thresholds um, when we when we wanted to work with material and and how to test it a bit like Desi was 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 talking about you know where do you get a life cycle analysis input from um, where can you actually check how much biocarbon is in your material, right? Uh, how how do you best do the biodegradability studies, and 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 how far can you take it? And, and for us, the big lesson was: okay, we set ourselves an ambitious goal, right? Um, we said, okay, we're going to use the USDA Bio Preferred Product Certification Scheme to have an external partner check on the biocarbon content, and we only wanted to talk about a bio-based chemical if we had at least 70 plus percent of any ingredient in the product needed to be biocarbon based 
versus zero percent where the industry was right being petroleum based so however the ultimate goal was and still is a hundred and 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 so we really look at material that gives us at least 70 percent of biocarbon um, that allows us to match or increase on market performance consumer performance expectations and um, the, the the cost in our business you know the whole textile industry is driven on cost right but we have come up with smart ways of using natural based material uh, smarter ways of formulating that material that now we could get the cost so close to uh, the crude oil based uh, alternatives that really you know as far as i'm concerned if you are willing to to uh, buy a a running shirt for 60 70 dollars and you know we we add to that shirt like uh, one or two cent uh, of extra cost while maintaining performance and replace uh, petroleum based chemistry with uh, natural or renewable ones i think this is this is how we approach this this is where we want to be we we really want to make a leap in terms of um, amount of biocarbon in our products we're not going to compromise on performance and we want to stay within a marginal uh, um, upcharge on cost ideally cost neutral or even uh, less cost and 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 you know you have to be stubborn you have to hang in there it's not going to come from today to tomorrow um, it, it took us four years to come up with our first market viable product and it took us now the remaining eight years to come up with a product that now finally uh, has all these attributes I was just um, describing completely mm -hmm. biocarbon cost competitive performance driven so it's possible it's not easy it's a lot of fun it's a lot of sweat um, and tears um, but it's worthwhile to 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 hang in there so uh, one last comment i think the way we define success is with with these new materials we we only think of a material being successful if we can develop a market viable application you know it, having these thousands of new biomaterials it is great but really for us it doesn't mean a lot if we can't bring it to the consumer so only if we can develop a market viable application we we would consider that a successful project that's great matthias could you just speak to any of the brands that you're currently working with by name for any of the people who are listening in on this panel that they can expect to have you know to bear witness to the bst technologies I mean, we, you know, I should foremost mention our, our uh, one of our longest and closest partner, you know, uh, brand over there that you all know, Patagonia is, is, is uh, a company, a, a partner we really appreciate because they backed us up right from the start. They looked at us and said, these are pretty crazy guys over there in Switzerland, but we, we like what they do. <laughs> and, and so we're going we're gonna to support them. And, and that really uh, lifted uh, the, the motivation, the spirit over here that we are on the right track. Um, but since then, really, uh, and you can go on our website and see actually the full list, but you, we, we were able to really bring on leading global brands uh, from many textile segments, like, you know, look into sportswear like Adidas, Puma, you look into outerwear, you know, like, like uh, uh, sorry, outdoor, like uh, Patagonia, Arcteryx, um, Odlo, Vodi, um, uh, the North Face. I mean, many, many brands, even into apparel with Levi, Gap. Uh, you know, these brands, if, if you succeed in what I've laid out that we want to present, then you can gain these adoptions. Even, you know, starting with a small team in Switzerland, you can get these global leading brands to adopt your technology. And, you know, 13 years into it, still being there, today being in this panel, you know, probably proves the point that it is it is it is possible. And yeah, please, you know, 
that, that, you know, there's a much larger list of brand names that we are currently uh, partnering with that, that have um, supported us in advancing green chemistry and adopted it. Um, and they can be seen on our website. Yeah, that's great. And the website is um, for the people. Yeah, for the people that don't know. So uh, beyond ST, one word, beyond ST.com. Great. Yeah, especially look out at the uh, Midori Biowick, which is the checker spot oil technologies that are incorporated into that wicking application. That's that's great. Um, Desi, um, you know, I guess I have to be a little vulnerable here. Um, when you guys introduced SuperSap resin for the first time, I think that was you and I's first time to meet one another. And this goes back to my, my intro about building skis ourselves just to try to free up some of the supply chain uh, creativity. And I remember being introduced to SuperSap right when you guys had launched and, you know, uh, the distributor had told me, yeah, there's going to be a cost implication. And, and we said, okay, but we think this is really cool. And, and we got to work. And I think you had a pretty um, small uh, quiver of formulations at the time. And, and um, so we, we integrated the SuperSap and, um, didn't think much about it, you know, it was just a, it was a, it was a greener chemistry, you know, we, we didn't have the analytical equipment, the visibility to understand how is it different. And now as I enter into a second phase here of ski design with Checker Spot and the Wonder Alpine brand, uh, we took composite and, and resin analysis very seriously. Uh, we took a lot of the, the Lingrove um, natural fiber um, coupon sandwiches and analyzed them across a variety of different resin profiles. And, um, you know, some that I was really trusted, tried and true and loyal to. And uh, it, what was interesting to me is that we found in the, in the deep analytical work that I never had the resource or, or, or perspective to even consider, I saw that the, the super sap resin system actually continued to improve in strength the longer we analyzed it. Um, how did biology end up being in a, like a secret ingredient for, for you guys with that? And, and just kind of, you know, I know like there's the sustainability marketing story and there's the LCA and, and, and all that, but like you guys turned to biology pretty early on to solve a problem. Um, and maybe just share with the audience and I'd be happy to hear just kind of what, like, what was that kind of moment for you guys to look at biology as a uh, consideration um, superior to chemistry? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, you know a, a lot of a lot of sub subjects that have been already touched on. You know, how you get to these end applications, um, starting from uh, natural material. I think a lot of times we were just trying to be as good, right, or or come up with something that was going to be as cheap, right. Um, you know, as we got more sophisticated and as we started to understand the industry better. You know, we got to progress that that concept to, to points where, you know, we can <clears throat> take some of these new materials, you know, and Matthias, M Matthias talked about this is like, let's go back to the beginning and let's let's redesign something from the beginning and not be, um, you know, constrained by the existing raw material streams, the existing chemistries. And so <clears throat> so we did that, you know, I think. Um, as we progressed and created formulations, you know, we, we took ideas about performance and then made new materials um, and, and were able to, to not just be as good or as cheap, but actually be better. So, you know, that, that's the work that all of us as scientists and chemists and engineers are doing behind the scenes that like you said i mean this is deep lab stuff like you know somebody buying a jacket off off uh off the rack at rei probably doesn't realize how much time matthias spent to make sure that that jacket's waterproof um but that's that's kind of what what we do and and and, and that's what we love so you know that's 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 our passion but you know again it's it's a constant evolution of just making sure that you know, we take we take these these backgrounds that we have in science and technologies, and are able to progress industries by by using that to to create products that not just are better, but also are are more sustainable. That's great. What brands are working with SuperSap today that uh, you can you can share with the with the audience? Yeah, we we had, I mentioned Burton early on earlier on. They're, they've been a great partner. I think um, you know <clears throat> they've taught us a lot about about how to communicate. 
um, what we're trying to do and, and, you know, have, have allowed us to kind of use those ideas to extend further. Um, we're gonna, with Earth Day coming up, we're gonna, we're gonna launch with, with a pretty big skateboard brand. Um, that's another application that we've been, been working in, into, um, you know, on the surfboard side, we've, we've done a lot of work, um, with both Channel Islands and Firewire over the years. They've been great partners. Um, you know, we, we, I mentioned building materials, you know, we've been, we've, we, we launched a, a countertop product, um, with a customer called Polycore. Um, and it's their sustainable product where they're using a lot of recycled materials into the countertop. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for new applications and new customers that, you know, we can, we can, um, advance not just the technology, but, but, but like the reach and and progress these ideas that bio-based materials you know can perform and and in a various in a lot of different applications and and are something that you know are viable for for future products oh, that's great I, I didn't know about the countertop application uh with the checker spot design lab coming through to fruition in salt lake city now our new build we we need a couple yeah. of <laughs> well i don't i don't really get some that it's a company it's a company yeah, called vertrazo so. they 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 uh they actually probably unbeknownst to, to most of the people out there when you put your your glass in the recycling bin a lot of times it doesn't get recycled um and so these guys have been been um by getting all this recycled material a lot a lot of it is quartz and glass and converting it into engineered surfaces for your home. So cool, cool product. This is fantastic. Let's take that offline. And yeah, sure. Contact. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then how can people learn more about the uh, entropy products? Yeah. So um, we, we uh, recently entered a partnership with a company called Gijon. So they, they acquired entropy about three years ago. It's, it's been interesting to actually have a marketing budget and not just me be meeting Desi on a soapbox. Um, so brand new website. Um, I think the, the area, and I mentioned this earlier, the area that we've been focusing on is really kind of educating people about LCA and, and, and how that can be used to, to, to measure environmental benefit and, and, and then, you know, quantify that information. So yeah, the, the website's chock full of that now. And uh, I think it's, it's a great place to kind of start to understand how companies like ourselves are trying to use uh, bio-based materials um, and improve the sustainability of kind of end products. Wonderful. Wonderful. I appreciate that. And what, again, was that website? Uh, it's site? entropyresins.com. Great. Yeah. Great. Cool. Right on. Well, uh, I think we're about out of time here. Um, I just want to pass along my sincere regards to everybody here on the panel and everybody who's been listening in to our discussion uh, I can assure you, we talk in circles for hours on end every week. Um, so this has been a real privilege to open up our. Uh, and uh, yeah, on behalf of Scott and Checkerspot, you can learn more about Checkerspot's technology platform uh, online at Checkerspot one word uh, dot com, and uh, learn all about our story there. And of course, the application that we've developed with the technologies internally, known as Wonder Alpine, you can find us online there at just W N D R hyphen Alpine. Dot com. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys very much for joining. Um, this has been great to see your all faces at the same time in this crazy world. So, so distant, um, but yet so, so close in the same respect. So, um, and so everybody listening in, I hope you guys have a great conference. Um, I'm going to go skiing and uh, <laughs> wish you all the best. Thanks, Matt. Thank Thanks, Scott. Thanks, right. guys. Thanks, Desi. Thanks, Thank Matthias. You.